Serp Garage. So what is it I could have hiding behind my hand here? Some type of pocket gun, you would assume, right? Boom! It's a Detonics Combat Master. Oh boy. Get your shoes on because we're going for a trip here. So here's a normal sized 45. Here is the Daytonics laid on top. This is the size difference here. It's substantial. This is crazy in the back here, right? All of this is crazy. You're like, what is going on back there? That doesn't even look like the same gun. Sights aren't even in the same spot. But then it all comes together up here. And you're like, oh, yeah, I guess it is the same gun. But the lines... The lines are even different. Let's get into this thing. Let's explain. Now, listen, if you really want to see a really cool video on this gun, uh, Ian over on uh, ForgottenWeapons.com has an excellent uh, video on this thing that really explains, in a nutshell, you know, the history. Probably a lot um, better than I would be able to. Uh, this is a new acquisition for me, so this isn't something that I was incredibly familiar with. I'm a big fan of 45s. I'm a big fan of uh, smaller, petite guns, you know, like pocket guns and stuff like that. So how this thing slipped through the cracks and I didn't really know about it, I don't know. But like somebody commented not too long ago on one of my 45 videos, you're a, you're definitely a, a, a cult, like a 1911 newbie. And I was like, yeah, I, I guess, I guess I am. I'm not even qualified to be making these videos, I'll be absolutely honest with you. But let's uh, let's take a look at this thing. And by the way, I don't want to just completely ignore the fact that we're going through this whole coronavirus nonsense craziness. I mean, I don't want to call it nonsense. There's actually people getting sick. But just uh, the overreaction is uh, scaring people a whole lot more than uh, than the virus itself, I think, you know. So I uh, hope you guys out there are uh, healthy and uh, stay in, uh, you know, in the proper frame of mind. Let's cover a couple of things first before we actually get into this thing. You know, we normally go through our stuff. I talk about the realistic snap caps and a couple of things. But I just wanted to mention something here uh, quickly. I made up this flyer, right? Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to try to increase uh, viewership here. Because, let's see, I made some notes. Uh, here's what's happening. I'm getting demonetized on all my videos, which I don't really care. I told you guys, I don't really care about the money, and that's the truth. I, I don't do this for, like, you know, for, uh, it's not paying any bills or anything, you know what I mean? Um, it's... But, but the issue is I'd like to have a an audience. I'd like to build an audience, to build viewership. You know, the goal here is to increase my viewership, you know. And slowly but surely, a little bit here and there, the subs trickle in. But I notice that 98% of my views are from non-subscribers. So it's almost like the subscribers are people that subscribed and then they never come back to look again. Or they, well, who knows, subscribers, anything could happen to a subscriber. They could die as a subscriber and the, their YouTube account stays active. I got a friend that died, like, years ago, and his YouTube account is still active. Um, so I rely a lot on you guys that just tuned in, maybe, to watch the Daytonics video. Help me out and subscribe. And to those people that are actually, you know, steady watchers, if you watch all the time but you're not subscribed, just hit the subscribe button. Just just get in there. And, uh, and if you're watching this for the first time, subscribe. If you don't 
like uh, the next couple of videos, then uh, unsubscribe, whatever, but at least give it a shot. Here's the reason why I ask for that, because I get demonetized, and then when I get demonetized, they don't get recommended in feeds, the videos, because YouTube wants to make money too. So they want their advertising dollars on your videos, and if you're demonetized, they don't make money on your videos. So they don't recommend them, they don't put them in feeds, they don't put them in the you might like this thing, and then if, then nobody watches it and you don't get any subs, and then it's just like a vicious cycle. But I noticed that some gun channels, like, I want to take this gun right now, I want to take it apart. As soon as I take it apart, bang, they demonetize it, because I'm showing the insides, I'm showing how it works, and that somehow seems to go against their policy, even though it doesn't actually say that in the policy, I noticed that... If I don't take a gun apart, it doesn't get demonetized. So, but I'm t I'm taking them apart. I'm not going to change my channel for these guys. You know what I mean? So, but there's other gun channels that take guns apart, and they don't have that happen because they have more subscribers. So that's my, I, excuse me. My idea is send a link uh, to my to my videos to your friends uh, if you have the ability to make a cool flyer like this, make up a flyer like this, put it at your range, put it at, uh, when you go to the gun show, throw some out on the main table where all the flyers for the other gun shows are. Throw, just throw it out there. If they throw them away, they throw them away. You could probably make a much better flyer than me. There's a lot of people that, I did this on an app on the iPhone in like five minutes. I had this thing done and I had printed some out. But um, circulate them around your gun club. Uh, comment on the videos and mention your club. Uh, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, and what else did I write down? Um, that's it. I'm saying let's just, like, YouTube will feel this channel is more legitimate with uh, some more subscribers and some more, you know, some more likes and those kinds of things. So... I'm just putting a call out there to you guys. Never done this before. Let's try to turn it up. Let's uh, circulate this Millsurf Garage thing around. And let's just see if I can get a whole bunch of subscribers and likes and views. And then maybe videos like this where I take a cool gun like this and take it apart won't get demonetized. And then by not being demonetized, they will be put up on YouTube's recommendations for more to see. And then we'll be in the flow of things. So let's clear this. We are clear. Let's discuss. Check this thing out. How cool this thing is. First of all, there is this, there is this dude. <laughs> it's like that's how the story starts. There was this dude. Look at the lines here. See how that's cut in? See, like, you got to take out a regular 45 and look at it and be like, oh, yeah, okay, so it doesn't have that. This pretty much here across the top is just one, uh, you know, like one uh, radius here, one constant curve across the top and then flat sides. And here you have, like, a flat top and radius, so it's, like, cut flat here. And then look at how it's taken out back here you put them next to each other you hear me sniffling I have it's the worst time of the year for this to be going on because I have really bad allergies in the spring and uh, my allergies are kicking my ass so it's like of course everyone's going to be feeling a little skeeved by you because you're sniffling but I do have this every year. This doesn't even look shortened, right? This is shortened. There's no grip safety back here. All right. It's going to be tough to know where to go with this video. Let's talk about a little history first. And like I said, you can check out Ian, Ian's video. He's going to do a much better job than me. But let's show you some of the paperwork that I have. First of all, I have this nice exploded drawing that I found online that... Uh, you could find too. This guy's biggerhammer.net. He has a couple of things. He has that, and then he has this thing. And this thing kind of breaks down, kind of like the different versions that came out. This right here is a uh, different than the Combat Master because the Tonics had other guns also. But these are the different ones that they came out. This one 
is uh, very early. It would be this first one down here. Matte blue, uh, not usually marked as Mark One, and it's not. And uh, what, other, what do we have back here? Uh, some production numbers for some very early guns and some information. That's interesting. But uh, and this also shows where who made the slides and the frames for them. Originally, when they were putting together these uh, prototypes, well, see, I'm getting ahead of myself. They were using like Colt parts at first, but then originally, then they started making their own parts. Let me explain who they are. I'm definitely, I'm definitely bouncing around too much. I really got to start from the beginning. Um, so. This guy, um, Unblinking Eye right here. I've used some of his stuff. He has some cool stuff online that explains uh, stuff about guns. So there was this guy, Pat Yates, okay? He worked for a company called uh, Explosive Corporation, Explosives Corporation of America. And there was this guy that worked there with him named Ken Leggett. And these two guys had an interest. Back then, the only shorter, smaller 45 than this one was the officer's model. And they were working with these full-size 1911s to try to work with them, too. They said, hey, let's come up with a, not just a compact version of it, but a subcompact version of it, which would be this size, three and a half inch barrel here. And these guys worked at that. And it was kind of like a thing one guy would make some advancements and another guy would make some advancements. They were literally taking guns, cutting them in half. And now this explosives corporation, it wasn't just, I don't think they just made like powder. Like these guys designed different types of explosives and like the CIA was buying a lot of this stuff, whatever. This was really like kind of like covert stuff. This wasn't like necessarily explosions that would they would do to like build roads or make mines or blow apart mines or buildings or things like that. These might have even been covert stuff, like they would build devices to explode and everything. Like so these guys were definitely good with their hands with parts and welding and making things. So they were like cutting down full-size 45s and putting them together. And now just cutting it down and putting it together or whatever, is, that's, you know, I'm not going to say it's easy, but that's definitely the easy part. And then making it work. Now, you know me, I would take apart these Browning designs, right? And marvel at how they work and how they move, but it's so far ahead of where I'm at to, to even to even imagine to take one of his designs and how much in his head do you have to be when you start working out the weight of the slide and the pressures and and how things are moving and spring rates and everything like that. I mean, it's like... This guy, Pat Yates, was all up in Browning's brain. And, like, how I envy that. How I wish, you know, I could be uh, in a position like that to, to be working with, you know, actually taking his same numbers and the same things that he had been working with when he originally made this thing. And you see how perfect of a balance it was. Even though it's not like a blowback gun. It's, it's got that... Uh, the dropping barrel that locks. You can see a drop there. It has that type of mechanism and everything, but still, to be able to put it together smaller, but still have it cycle reliably is like a huge feat. A huge feat. And like huge respect to this dude, Pat Yates. Now, this guy, uh, Pat Yates, they had this supervisor at their job. Uh, he was a um, he was a manager. His name was Sid Woodcock. Now this guy, if you research this guy, this guy was CIA dude, martial arts expert, and all kinds of craziness. This guy's history is sick. You just delve into that guy and check him out. But he was the manager at this Explosives Corporation of America, but he, when they were downsizing, he left and formed his own explosives company called Detonix. And, I um, mean, obviously that comes from, like, you know, Detonate, Detonator, Detonix. So that was another explosives company. And um, he 
called up this Yates fellow, excuse me, and he said, you know, I think that something could be done with these 45s. You guys are getting so close to having ones that function perfectly or whatever. I think there's a market for this. And um, he had patented, uh, Pat Yates had patented this. Now, this patent is for Pat Yates and Sid Woodcock and Jeffrey Beals. So, I mean, who knows? Even Woodcock's name is on this patent. I guess uh, maybe he had helped out to put some stuff together. Here's the patent itself. And uh, you could print this out. Uh, check it out yourself. It's four three four four three five two you do a google patents you go under there and you put this in that's the number and uh you can pull it right up you can pdf it and print it like i did you can just read it it's pretty wild but uh just them explaining exactly what their uniqueness is here and i'm going to show you that how this this isn't just like you say well you cut it down and then patent it or whatever no you gotta see what's going on in here we're gonna go inside and i'm gonna show you so let's see, what else do I have here? There's also this. You could find this online. Um, not this one. And this is another review. The Firearm blog has something on it. It's this. This is... you got to find this. If you do a, a Google search for The Legend of the Detonix Combat Master... You should be able to find this. This is an article from 2002. It says here where it came from or whatever. It's kind of like his manifesto. And it starts down here. And this is from Pat Yates explaining what he went through and what he did. Look at how long this is. And what modifications he did and the things he came up against. Here's another one. I got another version of it here. But uh, you, if you look around, you could find this. If you're interested, this definitely needs to be read. If there's any interest in how this guy actually put this thing together. All right, let me get all my papers out of the way. So we're going to get out our realistic snap caps here, of course. Let's, uh, let's get into that. The uh, realistic snap caps are totally inert. I've been beating the crap out of this handful of 45 ones here for God knows how long. And they are none worse for wear here. They're still going. You got this nice cushy uh, area where the primer would be that to protect the firing pin. And in a situation like this where you're checking out a uh, cool wild gun, you could... Uh, actually load it and cycle the action and test exactly how it would actually be working under normal conditions without worrying about a sticky firing pin setting something off or the round not feeding properly and getting caught in a certain way to set it off or any of the 8 billion other things that could possibly happen if you're using actual live ammo. If you're not using ammo, uh, nothing could ever happen. You know, what I mean? You're actually lowering your chances of an accident to zero, which is where I want to be. Again, it's allergies. <laughs> That's my disclaimer. Um, I have it every year. So you could see even the the magazine is uh, shorter, six rounds. Now what's bugged out here is that uh, inside the uh, magazine for a, uh, for a 1911, the follower, has like a flat piece in the back here and in order to come up with these um with these rounds you see how that piece has to stick out the bottom of the magazine you see that so now when you when you actually uh load this mag you're gonna see that this actually sticks out so what they called it was a loaded magazine indicator <laughs> like as if they designed it that way but really, it was either do this or only have five rounds in the mag. And they wanted to keep it six, so they did that. Now, as soon as you cycle the first round into the chamber, 
that goes away because you pull a round up and all the rounds move up one and then that goes so you're only going to have that when the mag is full so if you wanted to carry it with a round in the chamber and the magazine full you would be carrying it with this sticking out but if you just carried it if you just put a mag in and uh, cycle the action um, just like this and chambered around that disappears now it's a series 70 so it doesn't have this whole, um, you know, the firing pin block protection thing. So uh, there's whole stories about how the guy that put this together, how he carried it. He would carry it with the hammer all the way down. I don't know. But it does have a half cock position here that is safe. It will not, trigger will not drop the hammer here on this first position. So you could conceivably carry it like this pretty safely. And then that's supposedly why all this is cut out back here, partly to make it small, but partly so that when you draw it, it's very simple to ready it, to bring yourself into the ready position by cocking the hammer with your thumb. I'm not gonna get into a, uh, is that the proper way to be carrying kind of thing or whatever, and you know, don't get into an argument with that whole thing on the, in the comments. It's, it doesn't really, uh, it's not going to serve any purpose for our, for what we got going on here, because basically, um, this thing is, uh, you carry it the same amount of ways as you could carry a 911 is the same thing. You could, this hammer does the same thing, you know what I mean? So there's, there's no difference. The only difference is that there is no grip safety here. So if the, uh, if the hammer is back like this and... The gun is just sitting here on the table and nothing's depressing the back it, it will fire the trigger will fire it so that's the, really the only difference is that this is eliminated this the, the the grip safety is eliminated you have to keep that in mind um it's pretty wild how they move the sight all the way up here right you would think that a shorter sight a radius like that would have an effect a, a detrimental effect but you know what it's not excuse me it's not really made for long distance anyway so but um everything else that you do have this safety so you could carry it in this condition too with this, with this safety on and this will be a familiar feel to you if you're used to 911s when you when you draw it to click off the safety um if you needed to you know if you needed uh, it to work all right it's, it wouldn't be uh something that you're not used to now I took this thing to the range, and it was absolutely awesome. Um, now, here's what's wild about it. Here's what, uh, let me, you know what, I loaded it, but uh, I really don't want it loaded at this point. Well, loaded it with snap catch, you know what I mean. Um, here's what I thought that I was going to have a problem with it, because, so, just getting it and feeling it. I was feeling it was mad loose right here. It's like super sloppy. And I, for a regular 1911, you shouldn't feel that. Like even if it's if the hammer's back, it's still it's still pretty stiff. You can't even barely move the slide. You'd have to push the slide to really move it. It'll slap back forward like that. I didn't have that kind of action. And that's what you used to. If you push it, it's like it lazily comes back. It's like, bleh, you know, and it's just like feels really loose right here. And I was like, oh, man, this thing is sloppy as hell. What the hell? And then when I put in a mag with some snap caps like this and I went to cycle it, I was doing this. I was going, man, I can't even, I can't even pull it back far enough to chamber around. What the hell? And I'm like, oh, look at this. See, like that round didn't even chamber. It just popped out. So I had to use like my strong hand and feel it. Really give it a yank to pull it back far enough to, to to chamber around, you know. And I was like, "There's definitely something up with it there. What's going on? Why is that so stiff?" And then to try to cycle rounds through it, like to test the function, you really gotta like really muscle it and yank it, you know. And then I realized after um, shooting it, okay, when it functioned flawlessly. Um, since this magwell never got changed here, you could take a full-size mag. This is a regular full-size mag, and you can put them in, 
and, and, and use them. They will function, supposedly. But that was the, that's the only time I was seeing problems. And it's not really supposed to be doing this. It's just, it says you can if you want to. And I always said, well, you could carry a couple of backup mags, or even if this was your backup gun, how cool would that would be? Because the mags would go for each, either, and you would just carry it with this one in there. But the reality is, this is the only mag where it, you know, functions correctly. Um, and, and these are good mags. I didn't try a, a million different ones. I'm sure there'd be some full-size mags that would work. But uh, whatever, that's where I saw I had a problem with it. Now, I started to realize that this was all normal and that that's how they got this thing to function smaller with a lighter slide and shorter barrel and all that is that initially there's less um, spring tension and that as the action went back like towards the latter end of its motion it needed to be stiffer and I'm sure that that's what those <laughs> that's what Pat Yates if I was able to sit here and talk to him he'd be like yep you're absolutely right that's the end of it all, that's the dynamic that, that, that it came right down to, is that it was mushier at first and then stiffer at the end. And uh, this slide was not slamming back or anything like that. It was, it was working perfectly. So let's, uh, let's back up a little here and let's take this thing apart. Huh? I'm going to show you this is what's going to blow your mind now. This is what's going to do it right here. So you have the regular uh, takedown uh, piece here, and the slide just comes right off. This looks kind of normal, right? This is what you're used to seeing, just you know, a little smaller. Now this is where your mind is going to start tripping. <laughs> if you look right through there, you can see that that's where you know, that's where this guy comes through, right here. Right? But look at that. That's not what you're used to seeing down here. Check this out. How wild is that? This is what makes it all happen right here. And um, the barrel, this link is the same. Nothing different about this link that on a normal 45. But look at the front, look at the muzzle end. What's missing? No bushing up here. It's flared out. You see that? It's flared out to perfectly fit inside the slide without a bushing. See that? Look how perfect of a fit that is. Right, still drops in and locks. There's the locking lugs there. Here's the lugs on the barrel. Right? Still the same, same thing. It's blowing my mind up. When I saw this, I, I was like, unbelievable just the workmanship here to uh, take this down that far to not compromise the firing pin channel or anything else take off so much material here these things are just sheer artwork this blew my mind these are so this is such an original one see it says patent pending these are the these are one of those crusty ones. Supposedly they started the serial numbers at 2,000 and this one is at 4,000 something. So it could only be like the 2,000 something gun made. Now, uh, one thing that concerned me was that there's a burr right here. Can you see that? I didn't know whether I should take it off or not. See it right here? Right there, there's a burr. See it? I didn't know. And down here, there's a couple of burrs. 
like that someone put it together and it didn't sit right. See them down here? I could very easily, you know, take those off, but I'm just not sure if I should mess with it. But uh, reassembly, check this out. So the barrel goes in here. This is like more like modernish, like kind of Glockish or whatever, that it just has this removable piece, right? That goes in here. The link comes up there. Let me get a little closer here. So this fits in here. This sits right here. And that's how it all goes together, where the pin goes right in there. So now from here, you kind of take the slide, slide it over. And now you, you manipulate it. There we go. I'm going to go right there. Oh, sorry. Otherwise, you get another frame. It's hard to, some things it's hard to do and do on camera. Like, let me get this right. Let's try this again from the top. Let's try to see if we could stay in, in uh, view. Alrighty. We. Yeah, okay. This is hard enough when you could be in any position. Oh, look at that. It just happened to just fall where it's lined up perfect. Let's get this in quick. Nice. Then we don't want to make any weird marks. So we go to there. Then we line up that. And then hopefully, there we go. And we're together. Oops. And there we are. Let's, uh, what else? Did, what did we, what, what, where, what, what, what? Oh yeah, all right. One other weird thing, check this out. Here's the brass, okay? So I got plenty of like shooting video up there. And uh, I might've put some already and I'm gonna put a little bit more at the end check this out see how there's like a double strike this was only in the gun and out of the gun once these are right out of the box fired once there you can see it good here here let me get a pointer let me get a pointer so what i'm seeing here is where are we i'm seeing the main strike right here, okay? And you see right there, right at the tip, see that second strike? You can see it real clear right there. It's on every brass. Yeah, look, I'll pick up another one. Main strike, bang, and then it's like a rebound. I never saw that at any other my 1911s doing that. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention. Maybe it does that to all of them and I didn't know. But I pulled out some other old 45 brass that I have right here. Let me get one right here. This, oops, sorry guys. Jeez, terribly sorry. This is not uh, from this gun, so let's see. Oh, <laughs> maybe this is something that 1911s do and I never, <laughs> I never realized it because there's one right here. Oh my God, that's embarrassing. I just proved myself wrong. Well, I guess that's what it's all about. I looked at some others. I didn't see that. So this, these are even worse. And these are not, these are definitely from either my SIG or, yep, this second strike is happening a lot. So let's forget I said anything. <clears throat> let's move on to the next thing. What else do I have? You know, I don't even... I'm in awe. I, I, I can't even say anything else about this thing. I'm just... 
it felt it felt perfect it uh it handled well it for a gun this size blasting 45 rounds it certainly did not uh you know feel like that feel like it had a tremendous amount of recoil it was very tame very controllable fun to shoot it is a combat master i'm going to come back and do like a a second video on this thing because um, because I feel like I'm I, I feel like I just shortchanged it somehow or something I don't know there's uh there's such a history to this thing and I'm like uh I'm just learning myself it's tough to do you know a video on a gun that you found out about a month ago and that you just acquired like a week and a half ago it's uh it's difficult but I took it to the range and uh and it was fabulous. This is rubber back here. This isn't like aluminum. No, this is actually rubber. These grips are nice. And uh, I think there were some other things that this guy did. Like this edge, this sharp edge right here. See how it's fat? I think he like some of his models, Pat Yates, before he, you know, sold this idea to Woodcock. The ones that he was making filed that down to be more flatter and more curved took this button down a little bit so it didn't stick out quite as far he like went a lot further um with uh making it sleek and stuff like that and then the transitions actually mass producing them from Daytonics if they could even be called mass produced they were definitely they didn't make many of them and they were supposedly some CIA you know a lot of them were CIA contracts uh the the ones that remain oof and uh you see on the colt 45 auto on the barrel there's a lot of these barrels were marked like from colt i don't know if that's colt's actual marking but some of them were actually colt barrels so you could tell that that's what was used to actually make them and this is one they call this called a bobbed hammer that's how you know these older ones because the the ones that were after this had like a little bit of a protrusion here to get your thumb on. And these are like short and bobbed like that. So, uh, you know, I, I took the video uh, of like a, a, about a week ago of uh, me shooting it. So I don't even remember what uh, what's up there for me to comment on it. But it uh, it was pretty much flawless um, with with this magazine, with this six round magazine. Um, but like I said, with other magazines, with the longer magazines, it seemed like it would hang up on like the first two. Once the spring rate got down to where this spring rate is supposed to be, then it was working just fine. But there might be, there might be some, I, I didn't try a million different kinds of mags, you know what I mean? I didn't try, I didn't try these regular mill spec ones like this. I, I didn't actually try these. Maybe that's what I'll do next time. Give me a try. Look at the difference. Look at when you... When you see this thing in my hand right here, you can definitely see the difference in like that. <laughs> it's small. It's an optical illusion that when you look at it, you're used to seeing this shape, this thing. You're thinking about it like regular 1911 size, but that's a regular 1911. I'm only holding it slightly above. And it's like it's barely fitting in the frame. And then if I lay it on top, because of the angle of the camera, it's tough to actually see. See, like, if I just put it like this, and I put this on top, it doesn't. It only looks like it's, like, a smidgen longer, but it's really not. If I tilt it, you see, that's, it's a, sorry, if I line them up, you see, that's just the angle of the camera that doesn't really show the full amount that it's smaller. You can see the work that was done to nothing was added you know what i mean only taken away here amazing so anyway that's the detonics combat master at least that's the best i could do right now but i'm going to uh take this thing to the range again and i'm going to come back with some more insight and um i'm going to see if i need to deer deburr those parts on the uh inside and somebody would say you know if it works don't mess with it but there's a little like right there it's kind of like a a little bit of a hang up and I don't know if that's got anything to do with it you know a little hitch a little hitch and it's um well actually you know I think I determined that with the magazine out it doesn't do that see with the magazine out it doesn't 
I already uh, crossed that bridge and forgot that I was on the other side. That's just the uh, slide um, hitching up on the follower. It's uh, it's smooth as silk right here, so I think I'm just going to leave it alone. But it looks like that thing might have been out of position a little bit when somebody went to cycle it and they put a couple of gouges in that part. But that's the part. That's the part that you can't just go by. That's the, that's the heart and soul of this rare gun, so... Maybe it's best to not screw with it. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And again, remember, um, let's try to increase viewership. I'm calling on you. If uh, you're watching this video for the first time and you hung in this long, you definitely need to subscribe. I mean, who the hell would have listened to my nonsense for 40 minutes? If you did, you definitely need to be a subscriber here. So what are you waiting for? Just hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends, tell your gun club, make up some flyers, hang them around. Let's just really see. Feel good knowing. Watch my subscriber counts. Watch it go up and know that it had something to do with you. Uh, wouldn't that be cool? I would think that would be cool. Let's see if we can make that happen. And um, stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you all next time. Later. Thank <laughs> you.